Hi, you're listening to Bonus Points, the official podcast of Mr. Astor's Theology Class. Join us as we put out into the deep and explore the world of theology and beyond. Today, we're talking about devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Let's begin. Hello and welcome to episode 63 of Bonus Points. This one is being released ahead of schedule because this coming Friday, June 16th, is the Feast of the Sacred Heart. And I wanted to make sure that this came out before that. So instead of releasing this episode next Monday, it's coming to you almost a week early so that you can celebrate the Sacred Heart with me on Friday and every day. And if you listened to episode 62, which came out yesterday, then you already know that June is the month of the Sacred Heart. I thought it would be appropriate for us to talk about this devotion, especially since it has become one of my favorites. Before we dive too deep, remember to follow bonus points on whatever platform you are using to listen to it. That way you won't miss an episode, because it'll just pop up right there in your app. You can also check out our website at bonuspointspodcast.com. Most importantly, you can share this episode or the show with somebody and encourage them to give it a listen. All right, so here's how we're going to tackle today's topic. We're going to begin with a brief history of this devotion, especially the role of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. Then I'm going to highlight a few key elements of this devotion, like what does it mean to have devotion to the Sacred Heart? And as part of that, we'll talk about the traditional symbol of the Sacred Heart and why it is depicted the way it is. Finally, we'll talk about some practical parts of this devotion and how to live out a deeper love for Jesus in the Sacred Heart. Okay, let's start with a quick look at how this devotion developed over time. Because if you look at, say, the early church fathers, you don't see many references to Jesus' heart specifically. The Sacred Heart devotion in the form we're familiar with today really became popular around the 1600s, 1700s, but the ideas behind it are nothing new. As we'll see, the Sacred Heart devotion is really all about the love of God, and that goes all the way back to Scripture. Back in 1956, Pope Pius XII wrote an encyclical on devotion to the Sacred Heart called Harietis Aquas. In it, he said, The revered symbol of the pierced heart of the crucified Redeemer has never been altogether unknown to the piety of the faithful. In fact, we do see Jesus reference his heart in the New Testament. Jesus says, Learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. In the early church, we find lots of references to the love of Jesus, and especially references to the pierced side of Jesus. And of course, talking about the open side of Christ is just one step from his heart. And needless to say, The basic element of this devotion, which is adoration of Christ in his human nature and thanksgiving for his love, has always been a part of Christianity. Pope Pius says, But in fact, there have always been men specially dedicated to God, who, following the example of the beloved Mother of God, of the Apostles and the Great Fathers of the Church, have practiced the devotion of thanksgiving, adoration, and love towards the most sacred human nature of Christ, and especially towards the wounds by which his body was torn when he was enduring suffering for our salvation. Even if an explicit devotion to the heart of Jesus didn't come around until fairly recently, that doesn't mean that we don't see references to the heart of Jesus. For example, in the second century, we have St. Justin Martyr who says, We the Christians are the true Israel which springs from Christ, for we are carved out of his heart as from a rock. Of course, the person most responsible for spreading devotion to the Sacred Heart in its modern form, and using that term for it, Sacred Heart of Jesus, is St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. St. Margaret Mary was born in 1647 in France, and at age 24 she became a visitation nun. Three years later she began receiving visions and other revelations where Jesus appeared to her and asked her to spread devotion to him in the symbol of his Sacred Heart. He entrusted her with 12 promises for those who practice this devotion and told her that he would send somebody trustworthy to help her in this task. This help came in the form of her spiritual director, Blessed Claude de Colombier, who encouraged her and supported her 
even when many others thought that she was delusional or somehow like adding something new to the faith. This support was necessary because as a nun, St. Margaret Mary was cloistered, and that means that she didn't leave the convent, which would have made it difficult for her to spread a devotion, obviously. One thing that strikes me about St. Margaret Mary is that she had this incredible spirit of humility, which meant she was always on guard against being deceived. This was another reason that um, a good spiritual director is so important to her, because it was somebody to help her discern whether these visions were actually from God or not. You know, this is often the mark of a true visionary. They have the humility to submit everything to the guidance of the church, and they don't think they're like some special oracle who's above the law. In any case, the surest proof that these revelations were genuine has come from the abundance of spiritual fruit that this devotion has borne. You know, Jesus says, by your fruits you will know them. And this devotion has brought millions to a deeper love for Christ and his love for us. So why then? If the core element of this devotion has always been a part of Christian doctrine, why did Jesus appear to St. Margaret Mary after, what, over 1,600 years? Why didn't he appear to, say, one of the church fathers or one of the medieval saints or mystics? The thing about grace is that God always gives us the grace we need for what we're going through now. He doesn't give us like a whole bunch of grace as a lump sum and then kind of sit back and watch. He gives us what we need when we need it. In other words, God gives us grace for today, but not for tomorrow. So what was it about 17th century France that made the Sacred Heart devotion the grace that was needed for that time? And if it's surging in popularity today, well, Why? Why is it a grace we need today? At least as far as its initial appearance is concerned, I would say that God gave this devotion to St. Margaret Mary as a direct response to the heresy of Jansenism, which was very prevalent in France in those days. Now, Jansenism is named after its founder, Cornelius Jansen, or in, in the Latin documents that referred to him, Jansenius. He was a French bishop and theologian who wrote mostly about the relationship between grace and free will. You know, in the wake of the Reformation, this had become a major topic because you have people like Calvin advocating for predestination, that free will doesn't really have a role in salvation. Now, Jansen didn't go as far as Calvin, but he was definitely closer to the the Calvinist side of that debate where Jansen minimized the role of free will in our salvation. Ironically, as far as I can tell, Jansen himself didn't really say anything that was that heretical. It was his followers that really did it. Um, They were referred to as the Jansenists because they were all students and disciples of Jansen, but he himself um, didn't really say a whole lot that was super problematic. So that stands out to me because if you're one of my students listening to this, you better not start teaching something heretical and then have my name end up on it. Anyway, the Jansenists denied what we would call the cooperation between grace and free will. So we say that like even if grace is necessary, we know we can't save ourselves, right? We need grace. We still cooperate with that grace and we give God permission to save us right? Our free will is involved. Even if we don't, it's not a sheer act of the will. It's not my own strength and holiness that saves me, but there is a place for my free will. I'm the one who chooses whether to let God save me through that grace. Well, the Jansenists said, no, God either gives you grace, in which case you are saved no matter what, it is far too powerful for you to resist, or God doesn't give you grace, and you are damned no matter what, and there's nothing you can do about it. They also put a really strong emphasis on penance and our sinfulness. But they totally shifted the meaning, right? When we talk about penance, we think of it as like a way to make reparations. We, we've we offended God through sin, and so we do penance as a way of showing God we love him to kind of make up for it. Well, the Jansenists saw penance as something you have to do to placate an angry God, right? They focused on the wrath of God, and they said that recognizing our unworthiness and doing penance, you had to do that to try to make God, um, 
to, to satisfy his wrath almost. They thought of penance the way that a lot of ancient Romans thought about sacrifices, right? You have to do this to satisfy the wrath of God or the gods to keep you from being smited. So for the Jansenists, God was very distant, very mean, and certainly did not love you. He arbitrarily saved some people and damned others, and that's that. As a side effect of this, Jansenism also caused people to stop receiving the Eucharist. They put so much emphasis on our unworthiness that they basically had people convinced that you were never pure enough to receive communion. Now, we do say that it is a terrible sacrilege to receive communion while in a state of mortal sin, but that's mortal sin, right? The Jansenists said, there's no, you are never good enough for communion. You're always just this pitiable, wretched creature that God doesn't like. So in light of all this, it makes sense why Jesus chose this time to spread devotion to his sacred heart. In the face of a heresy that portrayed Jesus as being mean and distant, and the Eucharist being inaccessible, now we have this image of Jesus and his love and his closeness. And devotion to the Eucharist is an important part of devotion to the Sacred Heart, as we'll see. As for why this devotion is becoming so popular today, I think we're kind of in a similar situation. You know, for many people, God is distant and uninterested. You know, he's either the deistic watchmaker God who, like, creates the universe and then steps back, or he's just a nice guy God who kind of wants you to be a nice person and that's it. He's not really going to get too involved in what you do. In the face of a society that says that love should be easy and free from any sort of obligation or commitment, we have the Sacred Heart reminding us that true love goes to the cross. And as for younger generations who, it seems so often, they're just so lukewarm and ambivalent about everything, in the face of that, we now have the Sacred Heart literally on fire. It is a compelling image, right? So, Let's talk about what this devotion actually looks like. What does it mean to have devotion to the Sacred Heart? Well, when it comes to popular piety and devotions like this, you have like the object of the devotion. In this case, that devotion is directed toward the human heart of Jesus. Obviously, it's not just about that, as though there was something about like the organ responsible for pumping blood. Because, you know, we don't see similar devotions to the stomach of Jesus or the liver of Jesus. But we have devotion to the heart of Jesus because the heart represents the seat of love, to borrow the words of Pope Pius and others. So really, that's what this devotion is all about. It is devotion to the love of Christ, symbolized by his human heart. And really, that symbol shouldn't be foreign to us. Even in the secular world, we often use the heart to refer to the source of emotions and love. And in his human nature, Jesus had a literal heart, both as an organ and as like the seat of emotions, right? Devotion to that heart is a way of visualizing and enhancing our devotion to the love that was within the heart. In particular, Pope Pius identified three dimensions or the love of Christ, what he calls the threefold love. Here is what he said in his encyclical on the Sacred Heart. This is going to be a little bit of a longer quote. He said, For these reasons, the heart of the incarnate word is deservedly and rightly considered the chief sign and symbol of that threefold love with which the divine Redeemer unceasingly loves his eternal Father and all mankind. It is a symbol of that divine love which he shares with the Father and the Holy Spirit, but which he, the Word made flesh, alone manifests through a weak and perishable body, since in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It is, besides, the symbol of that burning love, which, infused into his soul, enriches the human will of Christ, and enlightens and governs its acts by the most perfect knowledge derived both from the beatific vision and that which is directly infused. And finally, and this is this in a more natural and direct way, it is the symbol also of sensible love, since the body of Jesus Christ formed by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary possesses full powers of feelings and perception, in fact, more so than any other human body. Okay, let's break that down. He calls the Sacred Heart the symbol of the threefold love of Christ. The first love is the divine love which he, meaning Jesus, 
shares with the Father and the Holy Spirit. We say that God is love, right? St. John says that in his first letter. That means that these bonds of love exist within the Trinity. The Father loves the Son, right? But only the Son takes on a human nature. And so it is the Son who becomes visible to us. And so we can't see directly the Father's love for the Son because the Father is invisible. But the Son becomes visible, and so we can see his love for the Father. And so Scripture calls Jesus the image of the invisible God. Jesus, with a human body and a human heart, can make visible what is otherwise invisible, primarily the love that exists within the Trinity. So the Sacred Heart, first of all, is a visible sign of the love shared between the three divine persons. The second love that Pope Pius mentions is that burning love which, infused into his soul, enriches the human will of Christ and enlightens and governs his acts. That's just a fancy way of saying that Love was the motivation for all of Jesus' actions. Our will, our decision-making, is always directed by what we love, right? So Jesus had a human will as part of his human nature, and that human will was always directed and inspired by the divine love that filled him and inspired everything he did. The third one is the one that Pope Pius calls more natural and direct, so it may be the one that is easiest for us to relate to. He says that the Sacred Heart symbolizes sensible love, since the body of Christ possesses full powers of feelings and perception. You know, at the end of the day, we know that the substance of love is in the will and not the emotions, right? Love is willing the good of the other as the other. And so love is a choice. It's a choice that we make every day, regardless of what we feel or don't feel. But we also know that emotions are good and that God often enlivens our will with emotions. Even if feelings aren't the most important part of love, they often accompany and strengthen our love. And so what Pope Pius is getting at here is that when we say that Jesus loves us, it's not just that he chooses to love us as an abstract decision because, well, it's the right thing to do, and he's going to grit his teeth and will what is good for us because it's, it's right, right? No. The love of Christ is a decision, yes, again, that's the substance of it, but that love was also filled with the fullness of human emotion that accompanies love. To say that Jesus loves you isn't just to say that he chooses your good, even if that is true. What the Sacred Heart reminds us is that Jesus also loves you with human emotions and a human heart. If you think about the strongest love you've ever felt for somebody, that beyond that is what Jesus experiences for you, right? He loves you passionately. When we talk about devotion to the Sacred Heart, it's primarily a recognition of that love, right? It's a conscious effort to remember and to recognize how much Jesus loves with the image of the Sacred Heart being a powerful symbol and reminder of that love. So let's get a little more concrete. What does this love for us look like? Well, first of all, the love of Christ is expressed through his extreme humility. Jesus is God, right? And yet he descends to take on our human nature. To quote St. Paul, he empties himself and takes the form of a slave. We even use the Greek term kenosis to describe this total self-emptying. By right, Jesus deserves the royal treatment, literally. And yet he lowers himself to be born into a barn, to live in obscurity, and finally to die like a common criminal. Even in the Eucharist, Jesus lowers himself for us. In the Incarnation, he lowered himself so much that his divine nature was hidden. In the Eucharist, even his human nature is hidden from our senses. He lowers himself to look like bread of all things. In Jesus' humility, we also see him taking on all sorts of mistreatment and dishonor, even though it is the last thing he deserves. Of course, we immediately think of the passion, right? Jesus lowered himself so much that he was willing to be mocked, beaten, spit upon, rejected, abandoned, tortured, and murdered. Even in the Eucharist, Jesus subjects himself to mistreatment every day. How often do we receive him at Mass without really thinking about what we're doing? 
How often do people receive him unworthily in a state of mortal sin? You know, my heart breaks when I hear stories about maybe like a a big papal mass or even a special occasion like a wedding mass where there might be a lot of non-Catholics or fallen away Catholics. And after mass, when people are cleaning up, they'll find hosts in the pews, on the floors, shoved into the hymnals. You know, this is the humility of Christ who continues to give himself to us even knowing that he's going to be mistreated. He became man for us knowing that we would kill him, and he becomes bread for us knowing that we will ignore him and abandon him and even receive him unworthily. So devotion to the Sacred Heart is about recalling and recognizing this love and this humility, but it's also about responding to that love. So how do we respond? Well, when we talk about our response, we say that we return love for love. In other words, if we recognize the depth of Christ's love for us, we will be prompted to love him in return. As St. John puts it, we love because he first loved us. This can take a few more specific forms. The first is that we make prayers of gratitude. We thank Jesus for what he's done for us, for his love, for his sacrifice, for everything. We may make a special consecration or entrust ourselves to Jesus' love in a special way. We also are going to have a deeper love of Jesus in the Eucharist. We will spend more time in Eucharistic adoration, keeping Jesus company, whether he's in the tabernacle or in the monstrance. And finally, we will be prompted to make reparations. It's like when you have a friend who maybe was mistreated by somebody, and you feel this compulsion to do something extra nice for them. You know, it's the same with Christ. We see the mistreatment that he was subject to in the Passion and in the Eucharist today, and we try to make up for it with our acts of piety. We show him the love and gratitude that was denied to him by so many others. We offer him our fervor and our passion to make up for the lukewarmness and coldness that Jesus receives from people he loves so much. In a moment, I'm going to talk about the Sacred Heart image and why it's one of my favorite symbols. You know, I have it on my laptop, my phone case, the walls of my house. I love it. But first, I want to mention these promises that Jesus gave to St. Margaret Mary for those who practice this devotion. Again, the emphasis here is on practicing the devotion. Like we talked about when I mentioned the brown scapular in a previous episode, this is not magic. This is not a loophole. It's not a get get out of hell free card. It's impossible to practice this devotion without also practicing the virtues in the Christian life. So Jesus' promises here are contingent on continuing to live in the way of life. Okay, caveat aside, what did he say? The 12 promises that Jesus made are, number one, he will give them all the graces necessary in their state of life. Two, he will establish peace in their homes. Three, he will comfort them in all their afflictions. Four, he will be their secure refuge during life and above all in death. Five, he will bestow abundant blessings upon all their undertakings. Six, sinners will find in his heart the source and infinite ocean of mercy. Seven, lukewarm souls shall become fervent. Eight, fervent souls shall quickly mount to high perfection. Nine, he will bless every place in which an image of his heart is exposed and honored. Ten, he will give to priests the gift of touching the most hardened hearts. 11. Those who shall promote this devotion shall have their names written in his heart. And 12. In the excess mercy of his heart, his all-powerful love will grant to all those who receive Holy Communion on the first Fridays in nine consecutive months the grace of final perseverance. They shall not die in his disgrace nor without receiving their sacraments. His divine heart shall be their safe refuge in this last moment. As you can see, Some of these promises imply specific practices that we'll talk about in a bit, but first I want to highlight a few things. First of all, Jesus will give us all the graces necessary for our state of life. This goes back to what we said earlier about God giving us the graces we need for today. You know, I have a second kid on the way right now, so I've been thinking about this a lot. I remember when my son was first born and how difficult it was to have a newborn. I mean, heck, it's difficult now having a toddler. And now thinking about having another little one, I find myself in prayer asking God often, you know, do I really have what it takes? Can I do this? And of course, the answer is a definite no. I don't have what it takes. 
Before I got married, I didn't have what it takes to be a husband. Before my son was born, I didn't have what it takes to be a father. But God gives the graces we need for our state in life. When I became a husband, God gave me the graces I needed to be a good one, as long as I cooperate with him and let those graces work. And so I know that the answer is the same now, right? God will give me the graces I need to be a father of two, just like he's given me what I have needed at every step of the journey. I also want to highlight promises 7 and 8. Lukewarm souls will become fervent, and fervent souls will quickly reach perfection. Now, perfection here does not mean perfect the way we might think of it, but it refers to the highest stages of the spiritual life. So it's saying that if you're lukewarm, God will set you on fire with love for him. And if you're on fire with love for him, you will advance in the spiritual life. You will not remain stagnant. I love this one because it's a reminder that God meets us where we are. You know, of course, he wants us all to reach the heights of perfection. He wants us all to love him with all our hearts, but he will always start with where we are and lead us from there. All right, there's a lot here, right? We could spend many, many, many hours in prayer thinking about the implications of this, that you know, Jesus loves us. I know it's so cliche to say that Jesus loves me, but that really is the center of it all, isn't it? So I have a particular particular love for the image of the Sacred Heart, um, the symbol that's used most commonly to depict his love. So it begins with the image of a human heart, as a reminder that Jesus had a literal human heart. Even if we know the heart organ is there to pump blood, it's a symbol of love, right? It's a powerful symbol of love. So it always is centered on an image of Jesus' heart, Some are really realistic and anatomically correct. Others aren't quite as graphic. But this heart is shown with a bleeding wound in its side. This shows us how Jesus' literal heart was pierced on the cross and blood and water came out. Along with that, the heart is shown with a cross on top and it's wrapped in the crown of thorns. These are reminders of how the love of Jesus brought him all the way to suffering and dying for us. It wasn't the nails that kept Jesus on the cross, but it was his love. This part is especially important because we have this idea of love nowadays that is totally separated from any idea of suffering, right? We want Christ without the cross. We want to abandon relationships when things get hard. But the cross reminds us that we can't have love without sacrifice. Every time we're tempted to keep things easy, Jesus shows us his hands and side and says, you see, this is, this is a big deal. Finally, the heart is shown on fire, representing the burning passion and intensity of Christ's love. This is maybe the most important part of the symbol, or at least my favorite part of the symbol. Um, and it, you know, it's so fundamental to, this, to the sacred heart symbol that when people see that emoji of the heart on fire, um, a whole bunch of internet Catholics immediately said, oh, that's cool, it's a sacred heart emoji. Um, And usually this fire is shown as a blazing fire. You know, if you think of a campfire, you can imagine the fire after it's been burning for a while. You know, maybe it's getting low. It's it's not that the fire is less fiery, but it is a bit more subdued. You know, compare that with a blazing fire that's hot and bright and moving and powerful. That's the kind of fire we depict coming from the sacred heart because it's the love that Christ has for us. Right? I think about this a lot, especially because we depict the Holy Spirit as fire as well. Things don't really come into contact with fire without being changed. They may be burned, but they can also be purified, strengthened, set aglow, right? It's the same with us. An encounter with the living flame of love never leaves us unchanged. By this point, you may be thinking, heck yeah, sign me up. (laughs) Or maybe you're just interested in practicing this devotion a bit more. So what are some of the specific practices that are part of the Sacred Heart devotion? Well, there are a few that are hinted at in the 12 promises or that have grown out of those promises. The three main ones I would say are commemorating the first Fridays, making a holy hour on Thursdays, and displaying an image of the Sacred Heart prominently in your home, um, something that's sometimes called enthroning the Sacred Heart. The first Friday practice is that you go to confession and receive the Eucharist, on the first Friday of each month, especially for nine consecutive months. In fact, many parishes will have first Friday liturgies 
specifically for people trying to practice this devotion. These aren't the only ways of having a devotion to the Sacred Heart, however, so don't worry if you can't check all these boxes right now. Maybe you find it difficult to make it to Mass and Confession on the first Fridays because of when the sacraments are offered in your area. But maybe you can make a commitment to receiving the Eucharist with reverence more frequently or going to Confession monthly. Maybe you don't live on your own, so you don't really have much of a say when it comes to decorations and displaying the Sacred Heart in the most prominent place in your home. But maybe you can can have an image that you display in the most prominent place in your room. Or even maybe like having a nice quality print isn't accessible for whatever reason. Maybe have it as your lock screen on your phone. So there are ways to fulfill the spirit of this devotion, even if you can't complete the traditional practices for whatever reason. Along with these things, we can also do some of the things we said above, especially prayers of adoration, gratitude, and reparation. We can find ways to incorporate these into our prayer life more, or even just throughout the day, just these little these little quick, um, we call them aspirations, like prayers that we almost breathe regularly, um, these prayers to the Sacred Heart, one of my favorite ones, and I try to repeat it just throughout the day, just kind of in the background, is, um, O Sacred Heart of Jesus, make my heart like yours. I know there are different ways of wording that, but that's the one that has, has come most naturally to my mind, is, um, Sacred Heart of Jesus, make my heart like yours. And so, um, one other prayer that I really love is called the Act of Consecration to the Sacred Heart. This was a prayer that we always recited before Mass when I was in high school, and it's, you know, it's one of my favorites. So if you're one of my students, um, or I guess more accurately, one of our alumni, you will notice that this is the prayer that we use to start class in the spring of your senior year for the Paschal Mystery Course. It goes like this. Most sacred heart of Jesus, filled with infinite love, broken by my ingratitude, pierced by my sins, yet loving me still. Accept the consecration that I make to you of all that I am and all that I have. Take every ability of my soul and body. Draw me day by day nearer and nearer to your sacred heart, and there teach me all that I can learn of your blessed ways. Amen. And really, that sums it up, doesn't it? Devotion to the sacred heart, especially by displaying images of it, is a reminder of what real love looks like. In a world that offers many counterfeits and even demands that we celebrate these counterfeits, the month of June stands as the month of the Sacred Heart to remind us what real love looks like. That even though we have often broken this heart through our ingratitude and by our sins, he longs to draw us into it and to set us on fire with that same love. Well, that's going to do it for today. Really, I encourage you to make this devotion part of your prayer life in some way. The love of Christ is the solution to all of our problems, and I think that this particular symbol of that love has a lot to say to our world today. Remember to follow bonus points or subscribe wherever you're listening and share this episode with a friend. You can also find lots of resources on bonuspointspodcast.com. If you check out the episode guide for today, you'll find a link to a book called Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, written by one of St. Margaret Mary's confessors and spiritual directors. I'm reading through this book right now as my spiritual reading for the month of June, and it's been fantastic so far. You'll also find a link to the Sisters of Carmel's page on Devotion to the Sacred Heart, a page with a brief biography of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, the Catholic Encyclopedia entry for Jansenism, an article by Bishop Donald Hying from, from Simply Catholic about the Sacred Heart, and an essay on the relationship between the Sacred Heart and the Eucharist. You'll also find a link to the novena that is often prayed in the nine days leading up to the Solemnity of the Sacred Heart, but, you know, you can pray it at any time. Finally, you'll find links to two papal writings on the Sacred Heart, Pope Pius XII's encyclical Harietas Aquas, which we've quoted a few times, as well as Pope John Paul II's letter on the 100th anniversary of the consecration of the world to the heart of Jesus. For now, though, that's all I have for you. Until next time, and statistically thereafter, I'm Mr. Astle. Thank you for joining us as we continue to put out into the deep to explore the world of theology and beyond. And, most sacred heart of Jesus, we place our trust in you.